Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to CE Elevated, a CSU Vet CE webinar series. I'm your host, Dr. Ross Palmer from Colorado State University, and it's a privilege to be with you this evening. As you may know, after this episode, we will be taking a break from future CE Elevated webinars to make way for our new CSU Vet CE podcast series that'll be launching in early 2023, and we'll talk more about that as we close our episode out this evening. Tonight, we're sincerely thankful for the support of MAI Animal Health, who has made this webinar episode possible. Tonight, we're joined by a very good friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Naomi Hoyer. Uh, welcome, Naomi. Uh, Dr. Hoyer is a board-certified dentist. She's assistant professor of dentistry and oral surgery and the dental service leader at Colorado State University's Veterinary Teaching Hospital. She graduated from CSU with her DVM in 2002 and worked in general practice for a decade before pursuing specialty training in dentistry. She earned her board certification in dentistry in 2017 and then left private practice in 2018 to pursue her passion for teaching veterinary dentistry. Uh, her professional interests include congenital maxillofacial defects and regional anesthesia. And believe it or not, every now and then she gets time away from work, not much, but when she's not admiring teeth, she does get to spend a little time with her family running, hiking, reading, or knitting. So tonight, Naomi's going to share her experiences with clinical dentistry case discussions and interpreting some of those shades of gray um, that I'm sure all of you will be able to relate to. Now, if during our presentation, you find yourself wanting to learn more skills from Dr. Hoyer, have no fear because she's gonna be leading a hands-on dentistry training course here at CSU Vet CE on February 9th and 10th here in our training center. Um, and it's a pretty cool course. Your registration fee includes her specially curated dental instrument set. And it's about a thousand dollar value. Um, and that's just included in your registration fee and that helps you to get on your way with your new skills. Anyhow, without any further delay, Naomi, welcome, and I'll turn the show over to you. Let's learn something. What do you say? Yay. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ross, and thank sure. you so much, everyone, for being here. I so appreciate you taking out uh, time out of your schedule this evening. Um, again, like Dr. Palmer said, my name is Naomi Hoyer. I am the one in the middle here holding the endotracheal tube for this adorable little honey bear that we did a procedure on. Um, I was in general practice for 10 years, so um, I I really like to think that a lot of the continuing education that I provide really comes with a dose of reality um, because I am very aware of how different my life is in academia than it was when I was doing a whole bunch of general practice dentistry cases. And so I always like to have that angle um, when I am talking about case discussions. So tonight, the goal of our presentation tonight is just to expose you to the absolute common kinds of cases, not only that I used to see in general practice every day, but also that I get questions about a lot, both from people who come to the continuing education that I teach, but then also emails and phone calls that I receive from our referring DVM base. Um, and so I've broken it down into kind of three cases, um, all that talk about really common issues. So the first case that we're going to talk about tonight is Lucy. Now, this is not an actual picture of Lucy, but when I describe this dog, I think we're all going to get an image in our head of exactly what this dog looks like. Um, so Lucy was a 15-year-old mixed breed dog, and she was pre presenting to us for recurrent episodes of left-sided facial swelling. Got better with antibiotics, and then it would come back. She did have a history of extensive dental work. Her last procedure had been about three years before. This very sweet dog was adopted by some new owners after her previous owner passed away. So there was a lot of sort of missing gaps um, in Lucy's history that we just didn't know the details on. Um, like all, you know, good self-respecting mixed breed dogs, it was very clear from looking at um, her that Lucy was mostly a Chihuahua. She was a little bit big, so maybe some other kind of terrier mixed in, but Lucy had renal insufficiency. Lucy had stage B2 heart disease um, and then just looked really fragile. She's one of those dogs that, you know, you don't want to sneeze when you're holding her because you're worried that you're going to injure her. Um, so when we see Lucy for the very first time, um, this is what Lucy's mouth looks like. So this is what we're seeing when we're doing our conscious oral exam. Because always when we have these little dogs come in with recurrent facial swelling, my very first 
you know, go to in my brain that I'm thinking of is going to be a two through abscess. That's always, especially if it responds really well to antibiotics. And so just to orient ourselves, this is how all of our pictures are going to be oriented tonight. This is going to be the right side of the mouth. So this is like Lucy is looking at us. A little hard to tell. This is the left side, the maxilla. You can see these palatal rugae. And then you have all of this missing teeth. So no more maxillary teeth on the left and really just a couple on the right. And then we have a few left mandibular teeth and really no right mandibular teeth. But what I want us to pay attention to is even though we have this history of extractions, we also have a couple of little clues here that maybe things didn't go exactly how we wanted them to go when she was in for extractions. And so then it's time to take these conscious exam findings and talk to the owner about our recommendations. Now, this preoperative conversation can be really, really complicated in a dog who's 15 years old with multiple comorbidities. So the very first thing that we're gonna talk to about with Lucy is we're gonna talk really honestly about the risks of undergoing anesthesia at an age like this. Now, I it makes me a little bit uncomfortable when I hear owners tell me that they're, they have had the recommendation that maybe their dog was too old for anesthesia. Because I think it may be that, um, you don't feel comfortable anesthetizing when you're in general practice. I certainly know that there were a number of cases that I was like, oh, no, absolutely not. I am definitely not anesthetizing this patient. But with the support of our amazing anesthesiology department, which I, I could not function without, um, we're able to anesthetize the oldest and sickest little creatures that you can imagine. But that certainly doesn't mean that it's risk-free. So I'm gonna to wanna to have a super honest conversation with this owner about are the risks that we may encounter with anesthetizing this really old dog with comorbidity worth it when it comes to treating this dental disease? And in Lucy's case, I think the answer is yes. And that is because of these recurrent areas of facial swelling. Also because by this point, Lucy was starting to show some signs of oral pain. She was really hesitant to have her face looked at. You know, you have to be careful because all little tiny dogs for the most part hate to have their face looked at, but it was pretty clear that she was really uncomfortable. And we just know that that facial swelling hurts. The other thing that's important to see here is that you can see kind of this sort of like white creamy material here. She had like purulent material draining out of her gums. So we're gonna be able to help this dog if we can safely anesthetize her. So how do we proceed with Lucy? With Lucy, we're gonna get her scheduled for an anesthetized oral exam with x-rays and prepare the owner that even though she's already missing a lot of teeth, we probably have a significant amount of surgery time coming ahead. Um, we're also gonna to talk to the owner about the fact that we may have a limited amount of time that we can keep her safely anesthetized. So we're really gonna prioritize the things that we think are gonna cause the problems the most for her. So once we get Lucy anesthetized, here's what we find. Again, let's orient ourselves. This is gonna be the right side of Lucy's mouth and this is gonna be the left side of Lucy's mouth. And these, interestingly, these are just some common X-ray um, artifacts. These are called whisker papilla. So these are the little papillae where her whiskers are growing out of and they have just become calcified with age. So if you see these on routine oral rads in older patients, it's something that we see really commonly that we're not worried about. So right away, while I'm looking in Lucy's oral cavity, I am seeing the teeth that she has left. So we have her 108, her 109, and then back here, you can just see the, the edge of her 110. These teeth are in trouble, right? We have profound periodontal bone loss to the point where we have stage four periodontal disease of this 108. It's really hard to interpret radiographs of the 109. It's hard to see it because you're not seeing the roots from the side. But when we combine our oral exam with looking at these radiographs, what we're gonna be able to identify is that we have some very deep periodontal pockets associated with that tooth as well. And then what we're gonna to start to see in lots of different places as we're looking around is this evidence of retained tooth roots. So teeth that maybe weren't extracted completely. And again, we don't have any records. We don't have previous dental rads. I don't know what happened at her last procedure, but they certainly were not complete extractions based on what we're seeing. We also have those in the right mandible. Um, so down here, this image on the lower left, up in the left maxilla. And this is the area, remember her, her swelling was the recurrent episodes of swelling were associated with this left maxilla. So we know whatever is going on here is causing this dog some problems. Her left mandible actually doesn't look too bad. Like we don't have a lot of bone loss associated with the mandibular teeth in that arcade. 
So once we get these x-rays taken and complete our oral exam, really we identify that probably the thing that is causing the recurrent facial swelling in this dog is some retained tooth roots associated with previous extractions. Now, tooth roots are something that I get a lot of questions about from RDVMs who are concerned about leaving them, about getting them out when they create them inadvertently, or if they just find them on radiographs. So I have a couple of different rules about tooth roots that I like to talk to people about. It should always be your goal when you are extracting a tooth to extract it completely. So we should always start with that goal, but sometimes things don't go according to plan. So if you are in a position where you feel like, you know what, I am gonna have to leave this tooth root because either your patient's not doing well under anesthesia and we need to get your patient awake, or you don't have good light, you don't have good loops, you really cannot see this tooth root down inside this dark, tunny, bloody little hole. You have a tremendous amount of other work to go on this dog. Sometimes we're in a position where we have to leave them. I'm not actually a huge advocate of um, basically drilling them out because lots of times on the other end of the tooth root is a really important structure. So if you're going to leave a tooth root, I would I'd much rather have you leave of kind of a chunk of it and not try to drill into all of it to get it out. But if we're gonna leave them, we want them to be small. This is not a small tooth root. Essentially, this tooth was cut off. This was sort of a crown amputation. So the tooth root that we're seeing in this x-ray on the screen that's associated with this large periapical lucency is the entire distal root of the maxillary eight. So this is a big tooth root that was just cut off right at the gum line. That is too much tooth root to leave there in that area. We don't want them to be shallow. So we don't want these tooth roots to be pushing up on the underneath side of the gingiva because what happens over time is just like we saw in this sweet little dog, these tooth roots are going to make an appearance. They're going to push their way out through the gingiva as the infection becomes more and more severe, and then they're going to become very, very painful. There's a couple of situations in which tooth roots really are not allowed. And the big ones here are endodontic disease, so disease inside the tooth, so a tooth root abscess. If you are taking out a tooth because of a tooth root abscess, we definitely cannot leave any portion of that tooth behind. Or kitty cats that have feline chronic gingival stomatitis. We really need to be doing full mouth extractions on those cats. If you find it and you don't want to take it out, we need to document it radiographically and tell the owner. And same thing if we leave it. If you have thought you were going to be able to extract a tooth completely and things don't go according to plan and you feel like you need to leave a tooth root to be safe, make sure you take an x-ray and then make sure you document it in your records and let the owner know. Because it's okay to leave a tooth root, again, not with endodontic disease and not with feeling chronic gingival stomatitis, but then you don't want the owner to find out about that from me. You want to let them know like, you know what, we're going to continue to monitor this as we have this patient come in every year, but I felt like I needed to stop trying to extract this tooth root so I didn't do any more harm or because I needed to wake your patient up or whatever the reason is. Um, crown amputations, like we think of in cats, and we'll talk a little bit more about cats in the next case, they really are only indicated with type two resorption. So if you have any other kind of resorption, we also need to be taking out those teeth in cats. So those are kind of my general rules for tooth resorption. Now, Let's get back to our little patient here, because remember, this is a dog who is fragile. We don't want to have her under anesthesia really a long time. This is a tremendous amount of work that we have going on in her mouth, trying to get out some of these retained tooth roots that have been there a while. The gingiva is very fibrotic, trying to get good flaps and also get out this um, right maxillary teeth that are associated with disease. We're going to want to have some priorities with this dog. We're going to want to pick some areas to really focus our efforts on so that if we get into the position where we have to recover her from anesthesia, we feel good that we've actually done some good in her mouth. And so what does that mean for her? That means I'm going to start with the maxillary retained tooth roots. I'm going to start in that left maxilla where we know she had the problem. So we're going to take out all those maxillary incisors, or sorry, maxillary incisors, take out all those maxillary retained tooth roots in the left maxilla. And then I'm going to go on to the right maxilla because even if it's not a problem yet, I'll tell you what, that 108 tooth is going to become a problem. We know that this dog already has a predisposition to get abscesses. So that right maxillary tooth is going to want to do that. Then I'm going to move on to the right mandible if I have time because those right mandibular teeth certainly aren't healthy. Ideally, I'd love to take the rest of the teeth out of this dog, but I'm going to save those relatively healthy premolars and molar and the left mandible for the end. Because if I don't have time to get those out, I don't think those teeth are going to become a problem in the rest of her life. 
cats too, right? So we think of cats. This is a kitty cat, Rex. He was an 11 year old male neutered domestic long hair who was owned by a fourth year vet student. She had adopted him three years previously from a humane society who had done some dental work on him. And then he came to see us um, and he had this sort of big cavitated hole. Um, we were initially worried that potentially there was a tumor there. But then when I saw this, I was pretty convinced that he maybe had a piece of a tooth root left in there. And then we took an x-ray that was confirmed. So we had some alveolar bone expansion. So you can see how wide that bone is getting um, around the area of his left maxilla. And then this little tiny hole, this draining tract is associated with this remnant of this canine tooth root. And probably what happened is this had a little bit of resorption. And so whichever vet um, did this before thought maybe they could do a crown amputation. These are super challenging cases because he had that history of having a dental procedure at the Humane Society. But in this case, this one was too shallow, and so this tooth root started pushing its way back out. So we did a lot of debriding because he developed a big oronasal fistula with this, got all that infected material out, closed it up, and he's doing great. But we definitely want to make sure that if we have those tooth roots in there, that we're documenting them and telling, telling the owners. So we're going to take just a little pause here to see if we have any questions about cases with retained tooth roots or situations that you maybe have faced where you have tooth roots that you weren't quite sure what to do with. Some some great stuff there. Um, question for you. I'm going to put myself in the shoes of the primary care veterinarian. Like you, I have time uh, in private practice as well. And so you talked a lot about how if you made the medical decision not to remove a selected tooth root, why, why that was and how you would communicate that with the owner. What is your conversation up front? Do you, do you educate owners up front that, um, that maybe there will be roots that I will not opt to remove and this would be the reason so that it takes the sting out of the post-procedural conversation? Um, just share with me what that looks like when you're on the, on the primary care end of things. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that we have to be really careful about when we're talking to owners about procedures ahead of time is that we are truly doing a good job of informed consent. And one of the things that we talk about when we teach our general practice courses or when I go around the country to teach at general practices is you have to be really careful about making sure that you are really getting informed consent. And so if your practice is not using a surgical consent form that is specific to dentistry for your dental cases, you probably really want to make a shift to that. Um, because one of the things that you need to have on there is, hey, there is a potential that we may not be able to get an entire tooth out. There is a potential that extraction sites could dehiss. And so there's a list of some things on a release form, a surgical release form for dentistry that don't belong in any other release form, right? I don't need to tell a spay um, that there may be retained tooth roots. So these are very specific to dentistry. And absolutely, that's a conversation that should be happening ahead of time so that in the eventuality that you bring it up again post-operatively, the client doesn't feel like they've been lied to. Because I think that is a lot of people's perception about dentistry, because it is a little bit of a black box. They they don't really appreciate the disease ahead of time in most cases. Obviously, Lucy was different, um, but most owners don't know when their pets have dental disease, right? How many times have we had these cases that had a tooth root abscess come in and the owner thought it was a spider bite because they just got this swelling all of a sudden? Um, and so they don't understand it. They don't see it. And then what you're doing is not really accessible to them. Um, and so there's a lot. I think owners have this perception, and I think it unfortunately is increasingly common that like somebody's trying to pull one over on them. So if you can just have that conversation beforehand and then revisit it afterwards, um, that's a really great tactic. Yep. Yeah, it, it reminds me of my world of, of uh, orthopedics and implant removals. And one of the things I oftentimes talk to people up front is, you know, this is the implant we're going after. We may remove this, we may remove that, but it's possible not all the implants will be out in the end because it could be that it does more harm than good. And that's a much easier post procedural conversation to have if I've pre-medded the client, if you will, with information sure. in advance. So very good. Now, let yeah. me also put you in the awkward position of, of, so now you are the second veterinarian to see this patient. Um, and you do have concerns that maybe something wasn't done appropriately or quite the way ideally it would have been done. Um, that seems like a delicate conversation. How, how do you handle that challenge? 
For sure. I think that is, you know, a very delicate conversation. And always when I was in general practice and would identify cases where maybe I found a whole bunch of tooth roots where we thought there had been extractions. And certainly now that I'm in specialty, in general, my policy is really to give grace. Uh, because I was a I was a primary DVM for many years. And I always tell owners, you know what, I don't know what was happening that day. I didn't see the case. I didn't see the pre-op x-rays. I wasn't there. I don't know what the complications were. Um, and I say, you know, like, I'm, I'm in the position now where I can say confidently these things because I have experienced this over 20 years of veterinary medicine, but grace is usually the way that I handle that. Um, and that was absolutely what we did in this case because we just didn't know. We, there was a huge hole in sort of how this dog's care had been managed before these very, very sweet people um, took this dog on. Um, and so I think in general, it's better to just say, you know what, I just don't know. Here are the facts for today so that you don't feed into somebody's um, maybe anger already. I absolutely agree. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah, we can only really speak to today, right? And, you know, right. I think, and I, again, putting ourselves in the shoes of the the referring veterinarian, and I think we've all been in that role where you're like, golly, your biggest fear, right, is somebody's going to beat up on me a little bit. And it's like, yeah, yeah. life's too short to beat up on anybody. So uh, yeah. extend grace. I wasn't there, but, you know, let's deal with the problems we see today. Move on, right? So yeah. wonderful. For yep, sure. I think that's what we have for questions now. Um, okay. I know you got a, another case or two more, or whatever. Let's, uh, yeah. let's see what you got okay. now. Two more Aldo. cases. Aldo, all right. Aldo, look at that handsome boxer dog. So yeah, case number two. And again, something that we talk to um, talk to vets about really a lot. This is a question that I get. So these cases are all primarily from many, many um, hours of questioning from our primary DVM. So this is an 11-year-old boxer. Like I think we can all guess in our heads what disease this boxer has. So this dog is coming in for gingival enlargement, right? So we'll call it hyperplasia often. Um, that's what I called it always in general practice. The reason we don't is because technically that's a histo diagnosis. But if you call me to talk about a case of gingival hyperplasia, I'm not going to correct you over the phone. Um, this dog has no history of anesthetized dental procedures. Really, his concurrent health issue, like a lot of 11-year-old large breed dogs, is osteoarthritis. Otherwise, he's really healthy. And this is what Aldo's oral exam looks like. So we can see, again, orienting ourselves that this is the right side of the mouth. There are a lot of Aldo's teeth that we really are not even going to be able to visualize because of how overgrown his gums are. And this is truly just a genetic condition. So we are not going to... Um, there's nothing, this dog isn't on cyclosporin, he's not on anti-seizure meds, he's not on calcium channel blockers, he is just a boxer. Um, and then as we're doing our oral exam, a couple of other just things that I want you to notice, and the most important is that even though <coughs> this is a boxer and there are a lot of areas where we can't see his teeth well, there is one area where we don't have a lot of gingival enlargement in him, and it's this rostral aspect of his left maxilla, and that is because we don't have a 305 and a 306 tooth. So we have two missing teeth in this dog. And with a dog that has no history of anesthetized oral um, procedures, especially a boxer disease, that is immediately ringing warning bells in my head that we're going to be having some surprises when we get this dog under anesthesia. So the other thing that's going to be really important as we're talking to this owner about as we're preparing the procedure is that we are talking about the things that we are anticipating doing so that we're avoiding some of those surprise conversations. And the acknowledgments of risks in this case. So I think the big risk with an older boxer that I always talk about with people is that I have seen now enough times that I get worried about it, this sudden death post anesthesia. So not during anesthesia, but within a couple of weeks after anesthesia of boxer dogs. And so I actually recommend now an echo and an EKG for boxers, old boxers, especially if they haven't been anesthetized before to screen for electrical abnormalities of the heart and early dilated cardiomyopathy, which I think unfortunately we see more than we think. And so not every owner is going to take you up on it, but it just makes me sleep better at night because I've, I've had several situations where I've had owners call and say, you know what, everything went great. You recovered great. 
five days later, he just dropped dead out in the backyard. Um, now with all those dental disease, that's a little bit trickier, right? Because we can't actually see the teeth. I can't see the attached gingiva. So I'm going to be having a lot of conversations with this owner that basically amount to, I don't know what these teeth look like under here, but I'm going to prepare you that I think we're going to be doing some extractions of this teeth now. Often, in my experience, these dogs with gingival enlargement, their teeth underneath all those gingiva aren't necessarily terrible. I'll usually have to take out some, but I'm not usually having to do extensive extractions in these cases. What I do find is that you'll have some of the smaller teeth, so often incisors, sometimes the very far back molars, that all of that plaque and debris that's been building up underneath the enlarged gingiva will cause true periodontal disease. And the reason that that's so important to talk about ahead of time, again, is because the avoidance of that sort of like, I was tricked by my veterinarian phenomenon. Um, when I talk to people about extractions, I always keep in my mind that owners go through what I call the five stages of grieving about tooth loss. And the first one is always shock and grief, right? Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. And then they sometimes go to blame, usually themselves, like, oh, I should have brushed, I should have brought them in sooner. Then and they go to, um, you know, sadness, you, you finally get to acceptance. But in my experience, you really want people to get through those five stages in the room with you for the consult, not over the phone when they're having an anesthetized procedure, because owners who are put in a position of having to make hard decisions about tooth extractions will sometimes agree to things that they have a lot of questions about, but can't get them answered. And then they feel tricked. And so then they get stuck in the blame and anger stage of grief, um, which is kind of a bad place to have owners. Um, so how do we proceed with him? We're going to give an estimate that has a really wide range in our practice. We're going to say, I don't know what I'm going to find underneath. I do know that we need to take away all that excessive gingiva. We need to get the gingiva down to a healthy level. We need to recontour that gingiva so it's a healthy shape. And then we need to, with our full mouth x-rays, look at all of the teeth extensively to see what's going on underneath. The other thing that I'm going to prepare the owner for is with missing teeth, I always, always, always talk to owners about what we're seeing in this radiograph of his rostral left mandible, which is a large cystic structure. So we have a little embedded um, mand mandibular first premolar right here. You can just barely see the crown and then this large cyst around it. This is called a dentigerous cyst. The rest of his teeth, he actually has pretty great periodontal health, right? He has this one little retained tooth root incisor here. And based on what we learned about on that last case, I would extract that because it's pushing so far up against the gingiva that at some point that's going to make a return into the oral cavity. Got a little bit of periodontal bone loss in this left maxilla, but his right mandibular teeth, his right maxillary teeth, and the rest of his left mandibular teeth actually look really great. So this is a very typical um, gingival enlargement case. I also hear really commonly whether or not we do biopsies for gingival enlargement, and we typically do. We typically send at least one in to make sure that's really all it is. And then sometimes you'll have an area that definitely looks more mass-like because there's been several, several published reports now that show that dogs can have neoplastic masses kind of hiding in their enlargement. So if you see an area of enlargement that looks more ulcerated, um, just different than the surrounding tissue. So if we're looking at Aldo's case, like I would probably be sending in a biopsy of something from this right maxilla or maybe the left maxilla. They just look slightly more irritated and ulcerated. So I would want to make sure that we didn't have something kind of lurking in that gingival tissue. So back to these x-rays. So now hmm, we have a little bit of a conundrum here because we have this cyst and this is associated, it's always dentigerous cysts are always associated with unerupted teeth. Um, there are actually a lot of different kinds of cysts that we see in dog's mouth. The more full mouth x-rays you take, the more you're going to start to see these because they're not always associated with something that we can see on the surface. So they are often surprise findings. Um, the most common tooth that a dentigerous cyst is associated with is this mandibular first premolar. Um, so if you are missing one in a dog of any age, we definitely want to take x-rays of it. Um, dentigerous cysts can be extremely extensive because it's just this pressure necrosis from this eruptive sac around this tooth that's causing this bone destruction, so they can get very large. This is Aldo's case. This is what we did. We made a large flap 
we extracted that little tooth, you have to very carefully debride the whole area of that cyst. We use a little tiny curette for that, um, just because there are neurovascular structures. If you try to do that with like a diamond burr or a cutting burr, sometimes you'll inadvertently drill into something that you really don't want to be drilling into. Um, and then this, in this case, we had to take out an adjacent uh, mandibular six um, because its root was fully involved in this cyst and the tooth was dead. The canine tooth in this case was spared, which is wonderful. Um, and then we always also send in a biopsy of that cystic lining because it's really important to make sure there are very good reports in literature, especially for older dogs of these uh, having undergoing neoplastic transformations. So we want to make sure that there isn't cancer inside that cyst because um, that's going to change our long-term treatment plan a lot. Here is a case of a much more extensive cyst. So we can see this lovely little first premolar. This one, you can see the caudal extent of this cyst is all the way back by the mandibular eights. This is what it looked like when we opened it up. This kind of ate away the roots of every single one of these mandibular premolars. It was one of the bigger cysts and it was bilateral. So this dog had this massive, massive, massive bone destruction in its mandible on both sides. Um, they can be very, very, very impressive. The other issue, the reason that he came in in the first place, is this gingival enlargement. So how do I treat it? Now, there are a number of different ways. All of them are great. My favorite is with this special kind of burr. We call it the 12 fluted burr. I've also written the actual ordering number for it down in case it's something that you're interested in getting at your own practice. The wonderful thing about this burr is that it is cutting. So it's going to remove that gingiva pretty effectively. It's also contouring. So we're reshaping the gingiva to get it pretty normal and it's mildly cauterizing. So before I knew this burr, I used to use a diamond burr, which works great, a long columnar diamond burr, but my patients definitely went home bleeding. Some people advocate using cautery. I think cautery is fine to use, but you have to be really careful because of the zone of necrosis that cautery creates around it, that you're not getting too close to the bone and compromising bone health. Also, you can do a really good job of killing teeth with cautery if you're not being careful. I'm not an advocate of laser because I think it causes too much peripheral damage to the gingiva, but I do know some people who use it. But I got to tell you, the 12 fluted burr, once you try this, I, I would challenge you that you're not going to want to try anything else because it's so great. So here is Aldo's before, and then here is Aldo's after. That is a pretty great looking mouth full of teeth that we were still able to leave the stock with a couple of exceptions. Then what do we need to warn the owner about? we've got to start some home care for this dog. So if we don't want his teeth to get back to where they were, his gingiva to get back to where it was, we're going to need to have this dog getting brushed, getting regular home care, probably an oral rinse, probably regular anesthetized dentistry so that we don't get his gingiva back to the state where it was. So Aldo, any questions about Aldo? This is one of my favorite. You just take a minute to read this because this is so funny. Um, I just love, I just love good, uh, funny veterinary humor. So, <laughs> um, so as far as questions, a couple, you know, one is, you know, you talked about how delicate debriding that lining of these detigerous cysts can be that you're trying to debride it yet. You have this fear deep down inside that you're going to hit something that I think, how did you say it? Fear of hitting something you don't want to. I assume these are vascular elements that you're afraid of. Any guidelines as to, I assume you want all of the lining out, but you also have this fear of things lurking beneath the surface. Um, help us help us overcome our fear and guide <laughs> us through that process. Yeah, so I just went, I came back to this picture um, of this dog that had the much more extensive dentigerous cyst. So what I would say is, I mean, my best advice is to just be incredibly careful, right? Because in this area in the mandible, it's which is where these cysts happen more commonly, we actually do see very, very big extensive maxillary cysts where you can get um, a little bit too up close and personal with your maxillary artery, which gets exciting in a hurry. Um, and so in these cases, my best advice for debriding is to make sure that you take out the teeth first, because once you've extracted these teeth, then you actually have a pretty good view of the area of bony destruction. And you can take just, they make very small little um, dental curettes and you can curette those areas pretty easily. Now there have been some situations, especially in the maxilla for cysts that kind of eat their way into the nasal turbinates that I do my best. And then I just warn the owner, you know what, like we did our absolute best, but at the risk of compromising a maxillary, maxillary or a palatine 
main artery, we weren't going to go any more extensively than that. So I think, again, that owner communication piece of like, just try your absolute best. And if you feel like maybe there was an area where I couldn't get it all the way, just be honest with the owner about that. Yep. I, I, again, that, that, that just right client communication and just the explanation. I mean, there is a reason I, I had to use my best medical judgment to treat your dog as I would treat my own. Right. And right. I, there was a point at which I thought that was the best way to go. So, yep. Yep. Yeah. Now, another client communication um, concern, as you mentioned, the broad estimates, and I think that's great, and and you know, because um, it just gives you leeway within which to work. But I think I know you've been in this situation. I'm sure everybody listening has been into the situation. Is is where you give them the estimate, and they're like, "Got to be honest, Doc. I'm capped at about X number of dollars." Um, and you're in this funny spot where you're like, I, I really don't know it's going to be that much. I really want the freedom to do the diagnostics to decide what I would prioritize. Once again, how do you handle that client communication challenge? That is another great question and something that we just, again, it's really all about talking through. And so I'm going to answer that question with two different hats on. So the hat that I have now, which is working for a specialty hospital. So one of the situations that I used to find myself in when I was in general practice, not uncommonly, was a client who would say something like, I will let you take out or I will let you clean the teeth, but I'm not going to let you take out any teeth. Um, now, if it's that situation where it's a client who's just like, I don't want you to take out teeth, then I just will not do it. So I won't do it I, because for me, um, the there is always a risk of anesthetizing a patient. Yep. Always. I wish it was zero, but it's not zero. And so I am not interested in doing procedures that are solely cosmetic. So if an owner's primary interest is just having clean, shiny teeth, I am not the veterinarian for them. Mm -hmm. um, now, if it's a situation where it's like, hey, I don't have enough money but I appreciate that my dog has this disease and I want to be able to fix it, sometimes I would um, get into situations where we would stage things. So we would say, you know what, let's for this first procedure, let's really prioritize the absolute worst disease. We have this much time under anesthesia that we feel like you can afford that the dog can safely do. So we're going to do this much now and then potentially we'll have you come back in three, six, 12 months with also understanding that like in that time, the disease is also getting worse, right? So like we may have more to do if we come back in six months. And so I think those are sort of the ways that I've handled it. If it is a purely cosmetic issue, we just don't do it because for us, it's not worth even the tiny risk of anesthetizing them. If it's a money issue, we really try to see if there are ways that we can work with a client to make at least some kind of medical care possible. Great, all right. What else you have? Got so another good. case. Meat potatoes. Okay, last <laughs> case for the night yeah. um, is Batman. And this is not a picture of Batman, but this is a picture of my own naughty kitty because I just couldn't resist because he's so adorable. So Batman, when we saw him, and there's a reason you'll see in a minute why I have a picture of kitten, a kitten, um, even though this case is clearly not a kitten. So Batman presented to us, he was a three-year-old and we knew he was three. This was a, you know, a cat that the owner had gotten as a kitten, had had him his whole life. So this is not one of these situations where he just got a guess. Um, and he was presenting to us, he was a referral for evaluation of feline chronic gingivostomatitis. But this cat was eating and drinking and grooming normally. Um, his concurrent health issues is just that he was adorable. He had no, he was adorable, cute, awesome, like no kidney disease, no heart disease. Like this is one of our rare, very healthy young patients that we're seeing. Now, I just have to say a quick word about this presentation because when our amazing client liaison gets a phone call from an owner about a case of suspected feline gingival stomatitis, she asks the owner three questions. She says, is your patient eating? Is your patient grooming? And has your patient have a good hair coat? And if the answer to all those things is yes, yes, and yes, then probably that patient does not actually have feline chronic gingival stomatitis. Because this is Batman's oral exam. 
So I think we can all agree the Batman has horrific teeth, right? This is a three-year-old, a known three-year-old cat. Like this is not some 19-year-old feral kitty. This is a tiny, tiny little young cat. And what we're seeing in Batman's oral cavity is that he has very, very significant gingivitis. He has very significant gingival recession and it's very generalized caudally, right? So his canines and his incisors are okay. So I get a lot of these referrals where the RDVM sends me this case and says, this cat has feline chronic gingival somatitis and needs full mouth six reactions. Except that you have to remember that to truly diagnose feline chronic gingival stomatitis, the tissue that we need to look at for these cats is that caudal oral cavity. And in his case, because he was doing so well, that's not actually what he had. So acknowledgement of the risks, the great news is with a young, healthy, young three-year-old cat, they're pretty minimal. So yay, unlike some of our other patients. So we're just going to be talking about our standard anesthesia risks. We're always going to talk about them. Our anesthesia release form has the word death on it, and yours should too, because it's a risk. If I had to sign that with my kid when she went under anesthesia, we should definitely be having owners sign it with their pets. Um, so we're going to have that conversation, but our risks are much smaller. What are we concerned about with Batman's dental disease? That it's terrible. So I'm prepping this owner. I am going into this appointment after having seen this cat, knowing that I'm gonna be talking to an owner of a three-year-old cat about near full mouth extractions. Except for the canines and incisors in this cat, there's not a tooth in this mouth we could save. And so this is really important to make sure that because sometimes we slip into words like a few or several or some when we're talking about extractions. But if I'm talking about all, or most, I'm going to come up with a number. I'm going to say, Mrs. Johnson, who's my random client, I'm really concerned that I'm going to be taking out almost 20 teeth in your cat. So that when I tell the owner at the end, or when we have a conversation with the pets under anesthesia, that number is not coming as a surprise because that is terrifying. People will be horrified when they hear that information first. And this cat doesn't have feline chronic gingivostomatitis, but he still has a terrible dental disease that requires near full mouth extractions. How do we proceed? It's the same way we always do with anesthetized oral exam and x-rays. And then we're gonna prepare this owner that this cat is gonna have extensive surgery. So he is going to, on our radiographs, we're gonna see that he has profound periodontal disease, right? So we have bone loss of stage four periodontal disease with nearly every tooth in the mouth, except some of the incisors, some are not clearly not where they're supposed to be, and the canine teeth. But if there's not another tooth in this mouth that we can save. Lots of people don't know what the disease that this kitty has, and what this kitty has is a disease that is probably, you're probably seeing it more than you even know. I did not know about this disease until I started working exclusively in dentistry. And this is a disease called feline juvenile gingivitis. And the, the difference between these two diseases lies exclusively in the oral cavity. Now, some redness in the caudal oral cavity is actually really normal. And you'll see these little punctate red spots. Those are called lymphoid follicles. So in a feline juvenile gingivitis kitty, these are gonna be red and irritated. If you go back to Batman's oral exam, you can actually see them in his mucosa right along in here. The structure that's different from feline chronic gingival stomatitis is this palatal glossal fold becomes very thickened and very ulcerated in cats that truly have stomatitis. And as a result of that, these cats actually show up in pain. So feline juvenile gingivitis kitties, their teeth look awful, but they're still eating, they're still drinking, they're still grim, their breath is terrible, but they feel fine. Whereas feline chronic gingival stomatitis kitties, they usually feel terrible. They look terrible because their hair coat is matted. They often have bloody drool, their cheeks are swollen. These are kitties that have a, a much, much different disease. <clears throat> this doesn't just happen in pet cats. This is a palace cat, which is a really, if you've never seen them, they look like little Oscar the Grouch kitties. This is a zoo animal that we saw that we took all of its teeth out because of this feline juvenile periodontitis. This disease, I think this is a disease that um, is a great pretender. I think that we see it in a lot of feral and um, shelter cat situations. And it's one of the reasons why you will see cats, you know, you get those cats and they had, they were aged at like, like 
five in a humane society or maybe even like nine in a humane society because their teeth were so terrible. Well, it turns out that cat maybe was three. And then the owner is like, oh my gosh, my last cat lived to be 70. It's like, well, it probably didn't. It probably just had feline juvenile perio so that they thought it was a lot older because its teeth don't match the age. This cat right here is four right? Like she's, we know she's four. She was born in captivity. She's been owned her whole life. She's still eating. She's still fat. She's still drinking. Her teeth were hideous, hideous. And that is the hallmark feature of this disease. So feline juvenile periodontitis, the reason that it doesn't get recognized very often in young cats is because this magic age when it starts. So this is a disease that starts right when the teeth start to erupt about six months old. And then by about two, so if you look at this cat, by about two, often that active disease is dying down. We don't see as much gingivitis anymore. We still see the effects of it, but the gingiva doesn't actually look that bad. But we don't see it when it starts because often we don't see cats at six months old, right? Because they've already gotten spayed or neutered through maybe an early spay or neuter program. Then they got finished with their vaccines at about 16, 17, maybe 20 weeks. And then we don't see them for a few maybe even more than a year, because let's face it, lots of cat owners aren't great about bringing in their pets for preventative care. And then by that time, the damage is already done. If we do identify it early, so if we're seeing it right when it's rearing its ugly head, we can perform gingivectomies, so actually get rid of some of the proliferative, because this is gum tissue that grows over the teeth like it's a boxer, only it's proliferative and ulcerative, so it's bloody and yucky. We can trim it off, maybe take out a couple teeth that are really badly affected, and then have the owner start on home care, which is great if it's brushing, right? but it's a cat, so that may not be realistic, but oral rinses, oral wipes, dental diets, and then magically they outgrow it at like two. So it's a, it's a different disease than feeling chronic gingival stomatitis and really important to be screening for with these young cats. So that was the end of my last slide. Oh my gosh, this is a cat that we got referred to us for a, um, a jaw fracture. And I just looked at these x-rays and I was like, oh my gosh, hopefully that person has a lot of good health insurance because wow, please don't put your hand in the x-rays people. Um, but any questions about Batman or about feline juvenile gingivitis? Yeah, I don't have any in the chat just yet. But again, if anybody has questions, uh, do feel free uh, to punch those into the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to back out to a more general question. Um, and again, put myself in the role of a primary care veterinarian who um, you've done such a great job of pointing out, you know, it's not all just dental tartar, run-of-the-mill disease. There's all of these different diseases that you encounter. And so, so now I'm a general practicing veterinarian, and I'm jazzed by that. I, I'm excited, um, you know, to see these cases, and I'm accruing more and more of those cases in my practice. You and I have had at other times, conversations about headlights for illumination, about the use of magnification, et cetera. You know, where upon the process of, of handling dental cases, does that begin to make sense for somebody to have a headlight that they use? Is that something you get right off or, or when you're seeing a number of cases and the same for magnification? Just some general comments there. Yeah, no, I think those are great questions. So, um, you know, what Dr. Palmer, what Ross is talking about is surgical loops. So magnifying um, lenses in your glasses and then a surgical headlight. And I think really, I recommend that if you're doing any dentistry at all, um, because, you know, we have the CSU surgery department several years ago, got new, very, very high tech surgery lights that have a camera and, you know, they, I don't know, they probably do surgery for you. I don't know all the things that they do. And I think that they cost $150,000 is what I was told. And it doesn't matter because no matter what, when you are doing dental surgery, your head is always in the way, right? So like having a good, good light on your forehead is critically important when you're doing dentistry. And the more little patients, the more, you know, getting out of routine tooth roots you're doing, the magnification is just tremendously helpful when you are trying to get um, really good visualization down in a tiny, tiny little area. The other thing that's really important about surgical magnification and lights is that it actually is going to make you do dentistry in a way that's ergonomically much safer for you. So this is something that I harp on a ton when I go into general practices and when general practitioners come to the TMI 
I um, to do CE with us because a lot of people kind of get into this hunched bent over position with dentistry because it helps them see better, um, but it is so bad for you. Um, you will end up with carpal tunnel, you will end up with neck pain, with back pain, and having magnification and lights allows you to sit with your back straight really to be focusing on this little teeny tiny spot where you're needing to be doing surgery. If you're not ready to start with a magnification yet, I think even just starting with a good quality surgical light on your head can be really beneficial. Because sometimes, you know, using the magnification, it takes a little bit of learning um, because you are, you know, we call it loop blindness. Like you really are so focused on a tiny area that you have trouble seeing everything around you. But man, you work with a good LED surgery light on your forehead once, you're never going to want to go back. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of both. And, um, you know, and you're absolutely right. You know, headlights are amazing because even I, I don't care how nice your lights are. If you're trying to look in that tiny little hole, invariably, uh, you've got light everywhere else, but you don't have it there. And yeah. comparatively, they are inexpensive. That said, it is worth making, I think, a, a, a wise purchase. Uh, if you're I suppose it depends upon your caseload a little bit, but, uh, you know, I wear mine a lot. And so I want something that's not going to make me cross-eyed within yeah. 22 minutes of watching uh, sure. or, or wearing the thing. So good yeah. illumination that's comfortable on my head. Yep. So important. Hey. Yeah. I just, as a matter of fact, just found out a student told me today that the CU dental school has a loops fair twice a year where they oh, have like 10 different loops manufacturers come because, you know, for human dentists or endodontists or anybody said like they're critical, you can't work without them. Um, and so, yeah, if anyone's interested in CU dental school has a loops fair coming up and we have just been fortunate enough to sort of have a, a loops manufacturer agree to sponsor some of our dentistry courses and then be there so that you can try them. Um, um, and see what it's like to really have this magnification working with you. So we feel really lucky about that. Yeah, I think that's that's also a, a wonderful thing is to 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 actually be trained a little bit in how to set your focal distance and mm -hmm. you know how to use the two in combination with one yeah. another because there is, as you said, a little bit of a learning curve. There's a question yep. in our chat it says, do you do you check for Bartonella for young cats with severe gingivitis? That's a great question. And the answer is yes. And I would say there is some correlation, like it hasn't been very well established, but um, I, I, what I think we don't know enough about yet is if when you find it early, if they're Bartonella positive, if you do all the preventative stuff that you need to do for the mouth and also treat with Bartonella, are they more likely to respond to treatment? And we just don't know the answer to that yet. The hard thing is if they're Bartonella positive and they've progressed from that feline juvenile gingivitis into the feline periodontitis where we've already lost the bone, it almost doesn't matter because the destruction is done. And so the teeth still have to come out. Great. Well, Naomi, once again, I mean, I absolutely love listening to your lectures. They're practical, they're applied, they're challenging. Um, so again, a huge thank you uh, for another great presentation this evening. Um, certainly appreciate your willingness to contribute to this webinar series. I also, I want to thank our uh, sponsor for this webinar episode, MAI Animal Health. For those of uh, you who are interested, just as a reminder, Dr. Hoyer is going to be leading a hands-on training course here at CSU Vet CE Training Center on February 9th and 10th. And in that course, you'll receive that instructor curated set of dental instruments with your registration fee. Uh, and I always like to point out those dates look to me like they would pair very nicely with some wonderful snow skiing here in the Rockies. Should. Uh, once again, let's see. Oh, here's a question that just came up in the chat is, is she doing the later scheduled ones? So we do have a number of courses that are in 2023. I don't know the exact dates offhand, Naomi, you may. I do. Yeah. Let me, I'm just going to bring up my calendar. Yep. So yes. And the answer is yes, I'm doing them all. So I will be there for all of them. So, yep. Yep. So, so just so you guys know, what we oftentimes do is we kind of release our course schedule as we go. So right now, what you see on our website is courses through June. Um, and then 
here pretty quickly, and I don't know the exact date, but we'll be releasing uh, some of the course dates for the, the quarter that follows June, et cetera. Um, so, so keep your eye on that because we're always adding courses as we go. So um, once again, I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. And as a reminder, after this episode, we will be taking a break from the CE Elevated webinars to make way for our new CSU Vet CE podcast series that will be launching in early 2023. And in this podcast series, our co-hosts will sit down with a variety of veterinary guests for conversations that explore what it looks like for each of us to walk our life paths as veterinary students, veterinary technicians, and veterinarians. Uh, I'm certain that we'll learn from one another. Perhaps we'll shed the occasional tear and commiserate with one another. And we'll also be sure to look out for those laughs that make sense only to those of us who've chosen this crazy mixed up career of ours. So please be on the lookout for that podcast series. We're excited about that. You'll be able to access that podcast on the CSU Vet CE uh, website's community page or wherever you access your other favorite podcasts. And in the meantime, remember, you're more than a learner. You're a whole person. So take care of yourself and let's look out for each other. Have a great evening. <music>